This is the Criterion Creeps podcast, and tonight we're talking about Early Summer from 1951, directed by Yasujiro Ozu. No tagline for this film, sadly. No? But a synopsis. Mm. Noriko lives in post-war Tokyo with her extended family. Although she enjoys her career and her friends, her more traditionally-minded family worries about the fact that she's still single at the advanced age of 28. Damn. When 40-year-old business associate Takoko proposes marriage, Noriko's family press her into accepting. But when her widowed childhood friend Kenshichi returns to the neighborhood, she finds her heart leading in another direction. Uh-oh. Spaghettios. You know it. You know it. No. So, uh, Ozu, he's back in podcast form. In- Wow, you beat me to it. You, it seems like we just watched Ozu like mere weeks ago. It, yeah, it was. Really quick turnaround this time. It seems like the last, I know we complain about it all the time, but it seems like this summer has been nothing but Kurosawa, Ozu, and Bergman. Uh, and Bergman. Like, that's all it is. And, and, well, and that's it's going to feel like Renoir in, in a week. Renoiruary? Renoiruary. Yeah. Ren Wagist? Yeah. Yeah, so and what? So this is so this is an Ozu I had never seen before. Really? How many have you seen? I don't know. It's getting up there now. I've got to be up into twelve or thirteen. Uh well I've seen five. So that those would all be for the podcast. All for the Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. You, you haven't been watching them for fun? No. Really? Why is that? No. You, you you haven't popped on uh Good morning, since. Uh, that would be the only one I oh, would 10. watch. I'm only at ten. Okay, that's well. Okay, that's. I, I think well, okay. the ones I actually own, I haven't watched Autumn Afternoon yet, and I guess some of the uh, Eclipse series movies. I've seen some, but not all. He has a lot of a uh, seasonal based stuff, like early summer, late spring, late yep. autumn. Yep. Early spring. Fuck, dude. This guy's got something to say about the seasons. <laughs> Well, what is it? I don't know. And sometimes it's about the time of day, like good morning. That's true. And, or weeds. And, or it could be about stuff like Pass and Fancy. Cat Fancy magazine? Sure. Why not? So, yeah. Uh, never seen this before. Luckily, okay. it's on the Criterion channel. And Yeah. I mean, it, I think at this point, now that you've seen five Ozu movies, RJ, uh-huh. like, do you start feeling like... There's like visual motifs and actors that they keep, oh, yes. that, that are appearing all over the place. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, for one thing, definitely uh, the visual motifs. Um, like this shot he does, where it's like uh, through two, two or three rooms, and then you have the sitting table. What is that called? Like a katsuku or something like that, where it's like the sitting table. And then you have Pete. T- tatami shot. T- or, yeah, it's like yeah. It's, it's at that lower angle. Yeah, someone uh, on YouTube corrected uh, at some point the, the pronunciation, oh. but God. not in a menacing way <laughs> or oh, okay. mean, meany way, but in a helpful way where I'm like, I'm pretty sure we corrected ourselves in that point. But maybe but I could be mispronouncing it even now, and I well, still don't actually care. But you know what I'm saying? Down, at, fair, down, down at mat level. I, I do know. And, t- and to be honest, people could – People can correct us every day. We're not going to say it right ever because it's not how talking works. But uh, I mean, if you say they were they meant well, that's good. But anyways, a visual motif that shot like through two rooms and then with the table and then you have two people that are looking the same direction Mm -hmm. like off, but they're a little bit distant. Like that's a that's a big Ozu for me. Big Ozu, uh, and, yeah. where characters are talking directly at the camera when they're talking to the other person. Like it's not; it's starting to be explored here, and it gets mm-hmm. real heavy later on. Oh, oh, it's where this is the exploration well, phase. Well, 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 this is 1951, so this is three years before Tokyo Story. Okay, and uh, yeah, you definitely. I feel like there's a lot of it in. Let me just see here. I just. Uh, created the filmography in numerical order and see Tokyo story at yeah, early spring Tokyo twilight to come equinox flower and I, I think it definitely in um was it oh my god 
it's throwing me off all these these titles. <laughs> late, uh, I found it actually late spring, I think, uh, and that's actually older. Late by, spring by two years. Yeah. Well, late spring's def it it it's definitely older than early summer because, you know, do you get it? I get it. I understand, but but early spring come, but early spring comes after early summer. Uh the Ozu CU. What about? Okay, wait. We're, one thing we're not discussing is: Do you, you ever read Stephen King, Jerry? Do you know about Indian Summer? You, you ever heard about that? Yeah, I I do know about Indian Summer, but I don't know about Stephen King's relation to it. Oh, he. I think he says that in every single one of his books. Oh wow. Well. Yeah, we we were moving into Indian summer, and you go what? Yeah, like, Gerald, like only... Gerald's game. Yeah, well, that takes place in Indian summer. Oh, of course it does. You know, like a late September, mm-hmm. not quite October, but it's still like unseasonably warm. Mm-hmm. Do Do you know, Jared? I do know. Okay, okay. What were we talking about? It's a boomer thing, RJ. Who, Steve? Indian summer. Indian summer. Yeah. I mean, I feel like uh, weather, seasons, and climate is just fucked as it is, anyways, right now, right? Every every month is Indian summer now. So Noriko. Yeah. <laughs> she, she, she's a young woman living in the multi generational home that uh, sure. would be under threat in during COVID. Wow. As, as, we, as we watch this. Uh, wow. I mean, in Japan, it seems like they've got a handle on the masks. But I do wonder, are they wearing masks indoors? I imagine a few of them probably do. They might. They, they seem might. responsible. But yeah, so she lives there in this home with uh, her parents, her older brother, his wife, and two boys. These mm-hmm. two boys. This is the other, like, Ozu factor is boys. Please? Older brother, younger brother. And, and they look just like the same actors no matter what yeah. year it is one's mm-hmm. got, they all got their little ball caps short pants and they all, they all look like they're uh aiming for some some bad times mm-hmm. yeah, they, they all want to get uh get dirty and they want tr- train tracks for their model trains what kid doesn't want trains yeah. even bobby baklava had trains bobby you know? baklava <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, yeah. we haven't talked about Baba Ghoul for a while. We, we haven't. We haven't. What what better place than early summer? Yes. So, so there's like a whole lot of the um, the undercurrent of the the polite uh, the politeness of of Japanese culture is depicted in movies. Everyone smiles in sunshine, but underneath those smiles is like unbearable crushing uh judgment at everything you do as a means of control people and get the best uh uh, out of you by being this way i i get it completely because it reminds me of a catholic guilt in a way yeah it's it's very similar it's effective right Mm -hmm. uh so we have yet uh setsuko hara who is one of uh ozu's uh main actresses there's e- there's even a noriko trilogy oh uh, really <laughs> late 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 spring early summer in tokyo story oh okay yeah so Cause, we, cause we just have late she, she's this daughter that's just like yeah. always prevalent and um then there's like because like she kind of plays this the the observant daughter who's looking after the the parents in tokyo story tokyo, and she's yeah. got the she's got the doctor or actually no she's not the Sashal's sister, though she's the widow of the soldier son who died, and but she's like a better yeah daughter to her parents in law than not. that's right. She's the daughter in law, but she's the only one who actually takes care of the parents in Tokyo. Story. Yes, who yeah. are here as well, the right. actors who like I don't know. It's quite the transformation <laughs> from grandpa to uncle. Yeah, is that is that the or yeah, the uh, dad she, guy she, with the mustache? Well, right? the, yeah, the dad. So the brother, mm-hmm. or it's the brother, right? Who's the doctor? Yep. Uh, and and the, he's a doctor in but, that too. Well, I he's, think. But no, he's the he's the. I think he's the dad. Like he's the he's the grandparent. He's like the parents. The, right. In Tokyo Story, but like he's got super like dyed black hair in early uh-huh. summer. Okay. This is where things start I, getting. This this is where things start getting treacherous. You're like, 
where you're like, okay, this is like, yeah. cause like the, the familial things like, so Ozu obviously likes working with like his entourage of actors that he uses like time and time again. Mm-hmm. And when you have like these, like, yeah, it's like a lot of these, these rooms look the same. They could be anywhere. These actors and the family members, um, you, you have to like start separating them out. And like, I, I could easily see someone that's like watch all of Ozu movies being like, which one's this one? Oh yeah. So like, I would, just to like to jump it a little bit that was actually how i was watching this because i was like fuck i was like is where it's like a doctor son yes. parents uh that, two uh, little uh, boys so, uh, yeah a doctor who has to go see a patient and he leaves yeah <laughs> uh, a, uh like a daughter or daughter-in-law who's actually holding the family together but is also like the most like unrepresented I guess is what I want to say or like not appreciated or something like that you know like there there was so much to it I was just like holy fuck I was like is this just this is just Ozu man it's all Ozu. coming together this is all Ozu it's pure Ozu <laughs> undistilled you know? yeah, essence of Ozu essence of Ozu yeah Ooh. Ooh. that will be my uh, criterion essay essence of Ozu yeah that's actually not bad. I kind of like that. Rub that all over yourself. Ugh. <laughs> Get it in there. Ugh. So, um, the, the movie, like, for the first, like, 45 minutes, it's just kind of this open-ended narrative of just seeing the family kind of interacting. And you mm-hmm. get to see Noriko's life and, like, her friends and these things about, oh, so and so is getting married. And it's all kind of around the fact that uh, great uncle, kind of like, he's got to be one of the original, like, dirty old men of Japanese media. Because he's got the, the ho, 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 laugh, and he's, like, he's deaf, but he's, like, is he deaf? And he's, like, easily amused by, like, shitty kids. I I, I did like that, where I, he, he pretends not to hear, and then when he scares the kid, he's just, like, <laughs> yeah. he's, like, I got that little fucker. I do like when um, the, the grandparents that they live with, um, mm-hmm. he, he, like, gives them the treats for uh you know doing kid like doing minor kid things or i think he's like let, 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 yeah let me clip your toenails which i'm yeah. like yeah if kids don't like that and then he's like here you go for being good you get some treats and he's like yeah see you love me i love you and then once he goes tranny he goes i hate you oh hey what are you saying there i hate you and then he, oh and then he oh, <laughs> kids they say such shitty things you're like hey i've seen this in ozu movies before they're always mm-hmm. laughing off how awful children are oh yeah so while you're on that, uh, I, I, I got to ask, how do you take the bread situation? Are you are do you side with the dad or with the kid? So when when the kid doesn't get his train tracks because the yeah. the parent was responsible and bought food, uh, that big, huge loaf of bread, gigantic, it, like that thing was like it's, a brick. It's like three feet long. Yeah. And a kid in an act of uh, aggression and frustration throws the bread, calls it stupid and yes. kicks it. Yeah, I would. Uh, and then, as a child, I would have been pretty pissed. If yeah. you're like, if you want a toy, but then like, it's not like dad's going out of his way to like saying, no, 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 that's the bread. Like he's not. Like, he's just like it's this absent-minded kind of crap dad mm-hmm. who's like not even interacting with his kid. And yeah. it's like, so I don't know who's really to blame. Ah, interesting. So that's what I mean. Like, uh, so you have kids being kids, and then uh, everyone kind of lays into the dad afterwards. They're like, they're like, you're too hard on him. Well, I didn't think he like really said anything to him. He's no. just like, don't kick bread, you little well, shit. Well, there's the thing where like when they're kind of talking, like when um, dad and his wife are kind of like plotting out the future for Nuriko mm. and whether or not she should get married to this guy from the office. And yeah. uh, they're like making, they're having this real debate and they don't want their kid to overhear it. And the kid's just like, no, nah, I'm not going to leave. And they keep like, there's this weird tension that comes out of nowhere. And dad's just getting <laughs> pissed. And then you're like, oh shit, dad stood up. And then the kid's like, oh fuck. <laughs> When dad, when dad, dad, when dad gets up, it's time to fucking run, which is like, (laughs) great. I I like very, 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 very accurate and very, um, of, of, of the times of, of a very pan cultural experience of fearing dad. It's a great demonstration of a uh, nonverbal communication, Jared, with, with, with all... the undertones of physical violence. Yes, of course. But I think we've all been in that situation where, uh, you know, an older person is just like, is like, get out of here. And you're like, what if I don't? And then they, <laughs> they kind of, 
And then you're like, Ugh, and you you got to haul ass out of there, you know? That's right. Hauling ass. <laughs> so, well, yeah. So the first 45 minutes or so, mm-hmm. it's all like pure, just like hanging out with grandpa, getting things in order, the interactions, mm-hmm. the ins and outs of the day to day life of everyone in the family. There's no real focus narrative. And then it finally kind of shifts because old uh, grand uncle great uncle he's like oh why aren't you married yet <laughs> and they go yeah why isn't she married this was like never on her minds before this is definitely very important and we got to get we got to take care of her even though she's like seems fine all smiles and sunshine and her friends you know she's getting the pressure from her for married friends you just simply must get married you don't even understand life without it you don't understand mm-hmm. how great it is to be married and then her single friends are like uh I don't know about that. It sure it doesn't seem like a good time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you get angry admonishments at restaurants and <laughs> about how men and women should talk to one another. Cla- go, you, classic. People just going, you don't understand. You don't understand what it's like to be married. You just, you'll never understand. Never understand. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the next chapter of this of the movie is honing in on this wedding proposal arrangement where she's going to get married to a guy that we don't see. Mm-hmm. This this invisible man. This is this figure that's just like, oh yeah, no, that's that's what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Is that kind of like what the, the twenty twenty Invisible Man is about? I, think I haven't seen I, it yet. In gaslighting, it's definitely about gaslighting. Isn't everything though? Ultimately, you know, you know, bud, bud. So. So anyway, uh, yeah. kid, the, the, the little kids get, like, fucked off with this, like, lack of trains from yep. their, like, doctor dad. And you're, like, thinking, like, doctor dad's got to be, like, rolling in it. But, you know, this isn't, like, uh, North America, I guess, where you're, like, a rich doctor making, like, lots of lots of that state money. You Privatized are, healthcare. Yeah, yeah, you're kind of like, oh, uh, yeah, I, I, I work in internal medicine, and I, I got to deal with this shit because it's the right thing to do. Everything's mm-hmm. in an economic downturn in, in uh, Japan. It's cause still in that, that post-war where things are about to pick up, but it's not quite there yet. We got to live the way we do. You can't buy trains. So you can only get this bread. Kids are pissed. They're like, want to run away from home. Mm-hmm. And while there's uh, some action, RJ, some Ozu action, an ensuing child hunt. I uh, yeah, I mean it's uh it's definitely thrilling, thrilling to say the least. Uh, and of course, of course, it leads Enrico to meet uh, farm boy. What's his name again? Uh, 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 Yabi Kenchiki. Kenchi yeah Kenchichi Yabi. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Played by Hiroshi Nayonyanji from uh, of course. He, the Human Condition Part Three of all things and Tora Tora Tora. Oh, well, I mean, Tora 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 is one of your favorite movies. You talk about it all the time. I love that guy. Christian Bale's in that movie, I think. <laughs> I, I don't... Th- As a little kid? Uh, no, it's Empire in the Sun. Oh, those are different movies of the same event, right? Uh, probably. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. Probably. Tora Tora Tora. Yeah. Wow. It's Pacific, it's Pacific World War II. Empire Tora, Tora, Tora. Yeah, it's probably probably has some touch points there. So anyway, Enrico likes this this hick, this rural guy. He seems more mm. her style. And uh, of course, when parents' family finds out, this is like a mm. like just like a fucking generic rom com, RJ. Um, they're like, oh, hey, we disapprove of this. This is not hey there, this, son. This is this is not our decision for you. I mean, I think this is a real step down. He's he's not like older than you and into marketing. Um, mm. <laughs> it's like it's marketing, a, yeah, or whatever the fuck into business mm-hmm. into business in the city where you don't have to move anywhere. We can see you all the time. You're going to have mm-hmm. to leave to deal with this guy that you like more. But you know, begrudgingly, as the movie goes on, uh, they go along with it. There's a moment with a photograph. <laughs> being taken of this moment oh, in time yeah. and uh, then there's like a I guess kind of like a time jump uh, yeah not a big one not a big one but just like a couple days maybe yeah and then things kind of like settle in we get this poignant moment about the passage of time 
and how like none of this shit matters. Why are we worked up about this? Because like the movie the movie opens up with some Buddha. We we do get some Buddha and some burbs. Some bur- the burbs. Uh, no, uh, birds, but oh. with a B instead of a D. I see. You know, burbs. Bur- burbs. <laughs> There's a couple burbs in there, oh. but uh, one thing that Andrea points out all the time is whenever we're watching a show and uh, you have a character who has like normal hair, and then in another scene he has long hair. Yeah, she always go to show that time has passed. <laughs> And uh, that's uh, they needed one of those in this scene. Like they, is that like someone like, needed is that, stubble or something yeah. to show time had passed? Is that like uh, uh, Stacy Keach's hair in body bags? It's the only way you could know time has passed. Is that right. his hair has grown longer? That's true. It is a demarcation of the passage of time. Well, <laughs> well, that's what we're doing here, buddy. What? So anyway, what were you talking about? Yeah, we're, talk, we're, we're talking about the Burbs, uh, directed okay. by uh, Ozu. <laughs> oh, we're, we're, we're working with Tom Hanks and mm-hmm. uh, Henry Gibson. Yeah, do you think uh, like uh, do you think Ozu and Corey Feldman would have got along? I feel like it because Corey Feldman's kind of like one of those little kids that Ozu loves to have in his movies. Great dude. Great dude. Which one? No. So anyway, um, yeah. So this is a fine offering from director Ozu. Um, is it? Yeah, it's okay. I mean, does this movie need to be over two hours long for essentially what is a fairly straightforward plot? I mean, with mm-hmm. these movies, it's not really about the plot. But at the same time, uh, I've, I've seen, I feel like, the, the top of the mountain with the Tokyo story and I've seen late spring, which I feel like that movie is like so great early summer feels like some like a in-between movie. And it literally is an in-between movie, but it just doesn't quite like hit me the way that his best movies have worked for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, like not even like good morning with its talk yeah. of uh, farts abounding oh, yes. and, and color. The, be- mm-hmm. the beautiful colors that come our way. But, uh, I mean, there's like all the, the elements, I guess, of his movies are all here. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like, I guess like one thing too, is like there's a lot of variety of characters, I guess. It doesn't, like, not everyone is like very reserved and stayed and like the family seems to be pretty restrained. But like the other characters kind of on the outside of the home, like when they're having their like their restaurant meetings and stuff like that. There's like kind of like a uh, more depth, I guess, to the variety mm-hmm. of the characters. But uh, on the whole, like, I mean, the story is pretty basic. And I feel like the, whatever you want to call it, the Noriko trilogy plays sure. better in the other movies. So I definitely say mm-hmm. it's the weakest of the three. But that all being said, I think this movie is a, a very fine, uh, good piece of criterion ozu mm-hmm. And uh, that's about all I have to really say about it i think rj what did you think of early summer here in late summer 2020 uh some some call uh some call this indian summer yeah yeah and some say that uh some people like dairy main as well some people some people don't have never been to anywhere else do you think stephen king tra- well yeah he used to live in Con- anyways we're not talking about stephen king right now anyways anyways i uh, i hit my table there and i had to jump ahead uh what movie was it oh early summer i forgot because all those titles are so familiar um i'm pretty much right with you i think it's i think it's got some good stuff in there but uh there there are a few things that i'm like "Mm," it keeps it from uh being mint ozu as you would say Mm -hmm. Uh, i do think good morning is my favorite for sure and then i would say tokyo story under that even though like when we watched tokyo story i was kind of like i was like it's good but it didn't really like hit me as it seems to hit everyone else. Um, early summer, I think, has all those those pure Ozu isms. Uh, like it's vintage Ozu. Like when <laughs> when I when it started, I was just like, oh yeah. I was like, this is just it's just this is Ozu. Where mm-hmm. it's like those those shots of the tables and rooms, doctor son, a daughter who is like the actual star of the show or daughter in law parents who are kind of like there but also not totally appreciated that much kids running around being kids 
Um, I think the kids in this movie are one of the better parts, but uh, also the kids in Good Morning are better than the kids in this movie. So I guess he refined it a little bit later on. And Mm -hmm. that movie's more about the kids as a whole. So uh, the kids were really good in this, but it's better in Good Morning. The daughter is really good in this, but uh, the daughter story is better in Tokyo Story, I mm-hmm. guess. Yes. Um, that actress, though, uh, Setsuko Hara, uh, she's wicked good. Yeah. Like, you can really, like, she has a really interesting presence where she's always smiling, and you can tell when people are, like, being shitty to her that, like, it's kind of like, it's a forced smile, but it also, she does genuinely seem happy all the time too. Mm -hmm. Like she's just like such a a good person that you're like, man, this is like, this lady is just one of the, one of the only good people in the world. I think (laughs) when I see her, that's what I think. It's like, she, she's an actual good person. Look at her. She's like doing all these nice things and like trying to take care of people. And then even when people are like, you're getting old, you, you old bag, you got to get married. She's like, thank you for your input. <laughs> and you can tell she actually means it in like kind of a nice way. She's like, she's like, I appreciate your concern for me, but I am fine. <laughs> so uh, she's got a uh, she's got a real presence. I can see why Ozu uh, put her put her in a, a lot of her his movies because it's like, yeah, this this lady's legit. I'm on board with that. Um, so you got a lot of uh, the Ozuisms, uh, which is a new word that we invented. Uh, I also think this movie, it's funny that this movie has a, a really strong pro single agenda where it's just like uh, you see these married people and you see that they're like just kind of unhappy a lot. And then not even unhappy, but like you see some of the troubles that are with that. And then you see like, the single people and it's not even like the marriage itself doesn't seem bad, but it's the way that the people talk about the marriage to other people. You're just like, man, you're a, you're not painting the nicest picture here for this lady where everyone's like, you should get married. And then it's like, but my fucking husband, I fed him some carrots yesterday and he lost his goddamn mind. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a, as a person who's just like coming out of a a year, what a year being married. (laughs) Yep. Did this resonate where you're like, oh man, that's what I want to go back to that single life. I mean, I think there's a, there's, there are elements that resonate to domestic partnership as a whole. Uh, Cause I, I mean, I've been married for a year. But you've been in a relationship for 11. Yeah. And we've been living together for like five. Uh, so it's like, it's like the marriage was a uh, kind of a moo point. Yeah. Not moot. I said moo. Um, <laughs> It's kind of a moo point. Uh, so I don't, I think there are things where like there are certain definitely elements of say it's like someone you're married to, or even if you just have a roommate, there's like sometimes little things can kind of get under your skin after a little while. So I, I do understand elements of that too. But uh, then there's also elements of being single where it's like, yeah, there's certain things that were really nice. But then there, there were other things too, where it's like, you know, Jared, sometimes, sometimes you just want to be held, you know, I know I do. <laughs> I, I, I love that. It's very comforting. Uh, and uh, I'm a big fan of the back scratch. Uh, receiving, not giving, because I've been told so I don't give, so the give equi- very good the, back the, scratches. The equivalent of like uh, a scratching stick? Uh, yes, but uh, it's... Uh, it's Like a claw Doing in the it end. yourself is never the same because you have to... You're moving, whereas like if you can just put your head down and you got your shirt off and you can have someone scratch your back, oh, it's very... Very good, Jared. So that's something you can't get when you're single. Right. Uh, I mean, you could pay someone to do that easily downtown somewhere. Yeah. Co- sure. Or ask a coworker. Ask a coworker. Hey, yeah. You knew uh, rub my back a little bit. Um, well, and they'd be the asshole if they said no. Well, yeah, because you're not you're not like suggesting anything anything more. Yeah. You know. Uh, what was I talking about? Yeah. So uh, I think it does do a decent job of showing those two things. Um, So there's a lot of good Ozu stuff. Like I think the kids are good. I think a lot of the dynamics are good between the people, but there are a few things that do definitely bring it down for me. It is, it is too long. Uh, I, and I know people get mad at us, but like two hours and two hours and five minutes is too long 
for yeah. this movie. Oh, I, I think Letterbox has it at 135, but it is in fact two hours and five minutes. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, um, so full disclosure, I did fall asleep watching this. The first, <laughs> okay. it took me two days to watch this movie, so I got about 40 minutes in, and I, I full on fell asleep because uh, I was tired, and I woke up and I did. I did rewind it. I didn't just like power on because I was asleep for like half an hour or something like that. Right. Um, and then uh, so I fell asleep. I woke up and I was like, I can't watch this right now. So I finished it the next day. Um, it's a little long. And then there is there's definitely some of the Ozu stuff where even though it's like a lot of his good things, it's I think there is a overexposure of some of those things too, where it's like, I've seen a lot of this before. And like, I know like thinking chronologically, it's like this is, came before, like say good morning and stuff like that. But in terms of criterion spines, cause that's all we care about. That's right. Uh, I was like, uh, for my viewership, I was like, I've seen a lot of these Ozu things before. And I feel like I've already, already kind of watched this movie. And it was done better in those other movies where it kind of he was able to focus narrow in on those certain elements that were right. good. So it's it's good and it's good and it's okay. You know what I mean? It's a decent enough show, but there's there were a few things that I was like, well, meh, meh. I just made sounds and I. Uh, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, yeah, I think it's I think it says it all. Those sounds. Meh, meh. But yeah, decent enough. I guess. Dees. Dees. Pretty Dees by mm-hmm. director Yashishiro Ozu. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want to hear about who hates mm-hmm. <laughs> this movie? I mean, how many people have watched Early Summer, do you think? How many? Well, let's take a look. Well, oh, we, we actually, don't, we, we actually don't. We actually don't. We actually don't don't know how many people have actually watched it but we know how many people have logged it in some fashion on letterboxd and it's 8.1k see that also includes the people who are i think it's on watch list possibly too i don't know if it appears in 5600 lists it's also apparently number 182 in the letterboxd top 250 wow it's part of the it's part of the club of yeah. which I've seen seventy. I've seen seventy six percent of them. I have seen fifty six. Not too shabby. You know, whatever. Parasite's number one on this list. The fuck. The fuck. Of course it does. That's the world we live in, RJ. Wow. Gold, goldfish. Goldfish memories. Goldfish memories. Do you think uh, people still talk uh, that affectionately about um, Roma? Probably it's 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 still in that window, but yeah. I, I don't. No one talk. No one watches Shape of Water anymore. Hey, what about and that, uh, that the, one? Best Picture. Yes, it did. What about the artist? That one, Best Picture Ooh, too. Bird Birdman. Birdman. Wow. <laughs> these are like our go-to movies, aren't they? Like, like if you think about like we we talk about more about these bad sh- like these movies mm-hmm. we don't like more than we talk about the movies we really like. I think uh, the very best depressing. Re- it is depressing, but that's what the job is, right? I think the best review we've ever got for the podcast was that guy who was like, I've listened to a few of these people's podcasts, and my takeaway is that they don't like movies. It's pretty good. I was like, that's that's very good. Nailed, that's, uh, nailed it. It's accurate. So who hates this movie? Uh, first up, well, I will go with a half-star review from Sydney Palercio. What's that? Palercio? Sure, sure it is. I fell asleep halfway through. <laughs> oh, wow. See, I did too, but I didn't let it get, get me down, you know? I guess they didn't go back and watch it. Uh, that's probably likely. I mean, but they did give In the Mood for Love five stars. Okay. And they gave uh, Grave of the Fireflies five stars and All That Jazz five stars. But one of their favorite movies, allegedly, is Parasite. Yeah, of course it is. I'm sure you would... Uh, guess but let's look at some of their other half star reviews because i know that's what you're itching if they gave early summer half a star do you think they also gave the florida project a half a star it's a wonderful life a half a star jared do you think it's a wonderful life is equal half a star rating to bohemian rhapsody Hmm. that's what sydney pelle uh also 
rated. So interesting. Indeed. Uh, n- next up, Andy Torino. Okay. Two stars. I don't understand how this movie could be so highly placed in Ozu's filmography. Easily one of the director's most predictable, average works. Not mm. only is the runtime a chore to get through, but the overall theme is so broadly presented that I can't help but feel like this was the result of Ozu's determination to make a life cycle out of a film, as he stated in his diary whilst discussing early summer. Steering mm. away from a clear plot and sticking more to the naturalistic aspect of family life and everyday life is exactly what prevents this movie from being successful in its message delivery. Plenty of unnecessary scenes that stretch beyond reason, plenty of motifs and secondary characters that don't bring anything refreshing to the table, and and a script that feels like a half-baked draft for some of Ozu's later titles that handled similar storylines with much more subtlety and wit. If you also add a good number of well-below-average performances, Early Summer ultimately ends up being one of Ozu's most underwhelming efforts. Fucking just... They took that knife, RJ, and they just mm-hmm. dug it in between the ribs and twisted. Well, I mean, that's Andy Torino for you, bud. If you want, you can check out their film blog at lifefilmlove.com. Wow. Uh, one of their favorite movies is Love Streams, which uh, we're going to be getting into that. Uh, uh, what was I calling uh, Cassavetes a couple weeks ago? John or Nick Cassavetes or something like that? Or Paul Cassavetes? You remember that? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, you know, Paul Cassavetes? You're like, who the fuck are you talking about? Anyways, uh, they like Love Streams. They love the long goodbye. Uh, here's some half star films, Jarrett. Uh, Back to the Future. Oh man, is a half a star. Okay, that's <laughs> just so that's Which absurd. I find humorous. That, that's absurd because yeah, Back is. to the Future is a pretty amazing movie. It is so it is. well. It is so well made, and the fact that it's like people dump on it like you're a dummy if you like that movie. It's like, are you fucking kidding? It's that I don't. I've never understood that when the, people are like, watch Back to the Future. It's like the, it's I, a good I, movie. All, all that like the opening of that movie is amazing. It's so good. Yeah. Just the, that whole movie it's, is it's just, it's the panning shot of those clocks and it's just the yeah. sound of the clocks t- ticking all like in unison and the camera just rolls over. There's no music and then you get the credits and then you get to the back to the future title comes up and it's just like, Oh my God, it's so good. Like it's like so obvious, but it's like, it's so well done. And how can you hate this? I think people hate it because it's so because people love it so much in like a way mm-hmm. that like it's pretty cringy. It's like people who get really into like it's it's like the nebula of Back to the Future and Ju- Jurassic Park, pop yeah. vinyls, MCU. It's like all this like I don't know. It's the most obvious movies that people. I just love these movies. They're so great. And you're like, well, you know, there are other movies that exist. Oh, yeah, they're boring though. It's like because they just watch like '80s movies and Ghostbusters. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Ghostbusters also is part of the nebula. Ghostbusters, and uh-huh. they, they can't actually include the Transformers movies, which are garbage. But they love the the toys. What about Fight Club? Just for uh, pro- uh well, the, for pro- prosperity. Maybe throw that in there. I mean, I think you're Back to the Future, Jurassic Park. Uh, Ghostbusters and probably Empire or like Empire, some yeah. kind of yeah Empire or some Star Wars and and uh, Christopher Nolan's like the a genius <laughs> he is but uh, that's a different story for a different day that's right I just find it funny that Back to the Future is a half star they also gave Antichrist a half star uh, Pain and Gain a half star Pain and Gain Aww, got some, it's not uh, so bad in, it's not too bad in, interesting filmmaking well I can I can uh, see people that feels like an objection on it to it on some sort of like ethical level uh yeah. and like they don't like michael bay because even like i i'm I'm not a bay head but even i like appreciated pain and gain the uh, how can you not love uh dwayne johnson's dumbest man in the world turn it's it's, it's pretty goddamn it's great. good it's great it's almost as good as uh thomas hayden church in killer joe never seen it and uh i don't have an opinion on it uh, the last thing I'll say about uh, Andy Torino, a lot of the five star movies are what you'd expect. Yep. But then Jared, five stars to Hail Caesar, Ooh. which is we know that's the worst, we know that's not true. Which is the worst? Yeah, not not true at all. And then uh, the, I find it's not, this the, it's not the worst. It's just, it's the worst of their movies. I think. Ah, uh, intolerable cruelty. Uh, it's been a really long time since. Or I've seen. Lady Killers, which I oh, don't. Yeah. I, don't. I forgot. Yeah, no, they've got some stink. A couple, okay, well, it's, a little it's, bit of stink. It's not a good movie. Yeah. 
Uh, but the other the the other two five stars I think are funny is uh, Blade Runner twenty forty forty nine, and then it's funny that he talks about how Ozu he's like I've seen all this before, and then he gave five stars to the Irishman, and it's like hmm, interesting. <laughs> interesting. Wow, we've really come full circle tonight. I know it's just it's that easy. <sighs> it's, it's like poetry. So Eric Bergstrom. Two and a half stars we'll wrap okay. up with. This is the first movie I watched on the Criterion channel. I also watched it for my movie club. What movie club do you think he's in? I don't know. Let's find out. Okay, well, his favorite movies are horror movies, Psycho Carry Halloween. Whoa. He just gave Blood Hook four stars. Wow. Which uh, I I watched that movie and I completely forgot what even happened in that movie the next day. Uh, I don't know, man. This dude's got some pretty good taste. Five stars to Freddy Got Fingered. Yeah. Uh, five yeah. stars to Blair Witch Project. Five stars to American Movie, Jared. You know American Movie? I know that American Movie. Five stars to Hook. All very good shows. Uh, let's go to some half-star films here. Uh, Geostorm, that comes up a lot. Phantasm <laughs> Ravager. Yeah, that was a bad show. Uh, fuck, the. I don't know what club this guy's in, but maybe I, we should get in on this. Is it? Uh, I mean, maybe it's a fuck club. Oh, he gave uh, this dude gave Scott Pilgrim one star. Her one star. Well, it's now Super it's now star. popular to hate Scott Pilgrim, though. I've heard that. I've that, heard that, that 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 seems to be the new one. I'll give uh, uh, <laughs> a man because it was like the anniversary, like the ten year yeah. anniversary of it, the like last weekend, like or two last week, week or two weekends yeah. ago, and I remember like seeing people just like hating on him, like whoa. No, yeah, I, I have no hey, idea. RJ, uh, Portrait of a Lady on Fire is the 13th highest I average it. weighted movie on uh, Letterboxd. We'll cool. see if people oh, are still on. talking about that next Satan year. Tango. Bullshit. I mean, no one's even watched. People don't even watch this movie. It's like people it's like it's like how, it's like how Human Condition Part One, Two, and Three are on so high on this list. It's like, I mean, it's so highly rated on average, but it's like, well, do we weigh this against how many people have seen it? Because I don't know. I, I guess I, you could. I call uh, this doesn't feel baloney? Co- correct. Well, it's not baloney. It's based on data. But yeah, I don't know if the weighting uh, takes that into account. Well, people's opinions are sometimes. But hey, Paddington 2 is 200. Whew. See, that should be number 14 over a uh, portrait of a lady on fire. I mean, this is a much more interesting list, I think, than the IMDb top 250. And it's definitely more because it has Satan Tango than the Edgar on it. Wright one thousand. Wow. Yeah. I bet you'd probably watch more of his movies than you'd watch any of these, though, RJ. To be probably, fair. but I, yeah. how many of these movies am I going to come across just doing Criterion Collection, though? Many. Yeah. Well, you, so actually, like, there's probably there's actually a pretty good crossover between these. Yeah, I, I I'm not I don't have the list up, but when I was looking at it, I was like, yeah, there's there's a few in here. Okay, let's see here. Edgar There's Wright, a seventy six percent for the one, and for Edgar Wright one thousand, they just call it. I have seen no way eighty. I've actually seen more of the Edgar Wright one thousand than I have seen. Really? Yep, eighty two percent of his compared to seventy six percent of the Letterbox Salon. So you're a big Edgar Wright head, or what? Apparently, I might be. I just might be RJ. <laughs> Damn, I, I I'll never... have to watch that Cornetto trilogy all over again. Oh, God. Watch Spaced. Uh, you see, you know, I, I used to be a big Edgar Wright uh, supporter. And then uh, things like hearing the Cornetto trilogy just kind of like... Makes your heart sink. It's just like, I just don't... Just watch Star Trek instead, dude. You know? <laughs> right? Maybe. Right. Maybe. Well, I think we did a good job, and uh, no one can have anything bad to say about us this time. Oh, Surely. they they will. No, well, actually, Ozu's early summer I, I came at this no, point in no, his no one's discography. Gonna, no, no, one, no one's ever going to listen to this episode. Oh, because they'll hear the first five seconds, and they'll be like, eh. <laughs> yeah. Five, six, seven, eight, Nine. I'm just counting how many of these movies we're going to wind up watching. Ten. Oh, wow. Little Women. Like the new Little Women's on this list, too. 
the new little women yeah see that's a it's kind of like what you said the uh goldfish memories it's kind of i feel like it's a flavor of the month thing like little women portrait of a lady on fire parasite like they're good movies but i i don't think they're well, gonna the, have the lasting potential that it, people think it'll even out it always does yeah um yeah i've got 20 22 of 58 of the movies i haven't seen for this uh imdb top 250 narrative feature films i have will, we will eventually see because they are included in the criterion collection hmm well, is that good? It's not bad. It is what it is. Any final thoughts here on early summer? Uh, I would like to have Uzu with Ozu. Uzo? Uzo with Ozu? Oh, no. What am I talking about? No one. I No one. Everyone's just stopped thinking about that. We're, I think I stopped we're, thinking. We're beyond that. I think, yeah. A long time ago. Um, is that good? After the break. Yeah, yeah. Life goes on, you know. Does it? This is a fleeting thing. Is what, it? Ha- what happens when this goes off the air? You go back to living your life. <clears throat> and guess what? In a week, you'll be back with us. People want to hear about DS9. In the blink of an eye. You know? All good things. All good things, buddy. <laughs>